Foothill, good to see you all here this morning. I'm Pastor Chris, one of the pastors here at Foothill Church, and we're just uh, excited, uh, especially those of you who are new and you're here for the Real Marriage Series. Uh, thanks for coming. We're really, really glad to have you. I want to draw your attention to something. In the front of your seats, you, you've got one of these. Everybody just grab that while I'm talking. Uh, we are doing a backpack drive for Stanton Elementary. Stanton Elementary is right around the corner from here. If you go up to Mauna Loa and turn left, you're going to run into Stanton Elementary. And um, and we talked to the school district, and they said that is the, that is the elementary school in the city of Glendora that has the greatest need. And, uh, and you can see some of the stats down there. 60% of the students at Stanton receive free or reduced lunch. That's the highest percentage. And so we want to bless them and help them. And so our goal is that we would, as a church, be able to put together 100 backpacks. And so if uh, may, maybe you've got kids in school and you can go bring some supplies or you can pack an extra backpack. Or if you don't have kids, uh, you can do uh, one or two of those. And, um, and here's all the supplies they need. You can stuff those in a backpack and then bring them with you next Sunday or Saturday, and uh, and you see the bin out front. We'll fill that bin to overflowing, and then we'll deliver them to uh, Stanton the week of of uh, the, the when school starts, which I think is the the fifteenth. So it's a great way for us to bless our our community, be in our community, and love them. And and this is just the beginning of things that we want to be able to do. But if you can uh, help us with that, we'd love your help. Pick up uh, one of those cards, or take that card with you uh, to Target or Walmart, and. Uh, uh, and, and go ahead and, and buy those supplies and bring them with you next Sunday. Well, we're in a series on, uh, on real marriage, and you're here on week two, and so uh, welcome to all of you. And um, uh, this is a book by Mark and Grace Driscoll, and we're not preaching the book, but we are just taking the principles and then finding out what the Bible has to say about that. Uh, and, and, uh, and each week, we're, we're giving away a copy of this. And last night, we actually we asked people on Twitter to, um, to uh, tell us their honeymoon story, and, and so we actually read one of the honeymoon stories last night that was hilarious, and I won't take time to do it this morning but uh, follow us on Twitter if you want to, and, and you'll see how this week you'll be able to win something. Uh, we'll ask you for stories to submit, but I do want to give away another book this morning, so um, let's talk. Does, does anybody use this uh, little-known social network called Facebook? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, anybody have more than 100 friends? Keep your hands raised. Okay. How about 200, 300, 400, 500? Okay. We're going oh, nice. Wow. You guys are friendly people. 600. 700, we got one, two, three left, 800, 900, 1,000. We're going to break 1,000 here. Okay, we've got, oh, okay, we got two down here, two in the, uh, how about, let's just jump up to 1,500. Anybody there? Down, down. Oh, oh, oh i got to go between 1,000. What do you have? What do you have? 1,100. What is it? I didn't hear it. 1,070 something. What, in fact, what is it? Around About 1,100? We'll see. You guys have made it completely difficult. I'll tell you what. I'm going to give them the copy of the book. They're married. But if you guys want a copy of the book, go out and say you won also, and they'll give you a free copy out there as well, okay? <laughs> All right. Way to go. There you go. <laughs> Well, today I want to talk about, um, I, th I think, this great principle. There's some of you, I know you come and you're like, you know, we want to have a great relationship, want to have a great marriage. We don't know how. And if you listen, there's all kinds of people out there telling us, you know, the way to have a great, the key to a great marriage is communication. So sit down and talk to one another. And I hear what you're saying, but here's what I hear. And you're, you know, and you have to try to figure all that out. And, and I think we overly complicate what it takes to have a great marriage and what the Bible would teach us about cultivating a great marriage. And, uh, and I think, you know, the reason we gave out the, the, the award for, for Facebook friends is because I want to talk about the issue of friendship today within marriage. I want you to listen to this. A couple of sociologists, I'm going to quote to you here up front. One guy uh, named Alan McGinnis wrote a book called The Friendship Factor. Listen to what he says. In our research at our clinic, my colleagues and I have discovered that friendship is the springboard to every other love. People with no friends usually have a diminished capacity for sustaining any kind of love. Now listen to John Gottman, another sociologist who uh, studied marriage. He says this, the determining factor in whether wives, according to his research, in whether wives feel satisfied with sex, romance, and passion in their marriage is by 70% the quality of the couple's friendship. For men, the determining factor is by 70% the quality of the couple's friendship. So men and women come from the same planet 
after all, happy marriages are based on deep friendship. It's friendship. And it's pretty simple. Okay, now we've got some convoluted understandings of what friendship means. And so I want to just try to unpack that in a different way. We don't normally preach like this. We usually go through books of the Bible. And I, I just tell you that this is a little unusual for us. But, but, uh, but I want to do this in a very practical, kind of fun way. Uh, and, and just take the word friends... Okay, and we've called this a, a friend with benefits. And take the word friends and, and uh, use that as an acronym for what real biblical friendship is and apply that to marriage. Okay, because God wants us to have really healthy marriages. And I think one of the keys to that, first is Jesus, but second is just having a great friendship. So what does that look like? And so we'll take each one in turn and we'll start with the letter F, of course. Um, and, and the first one I want you to see is that a friend is, the F is fruitful fruitful. Okay? Uh, we see this in, in Scripture. One of the hallmarks of genuine Christianity is fruitfulness. In fact, that's, that's what I would tell you is the hallmark. If you, if you are basing your, your relationship with Jesus on anything, you know, I, I said a prayer when I was, you know, 18 or 5 or whatever. I walked an aisle and you don't see any fruitfulness, then, then the Bible would say you have reason to question your, your, the genuineness of your salvation. But the Bible says that we should be fruitful. All the way back in Genesis chapter 1, he tells Adam and Eve, he brings them together. He says, okay, guys, be fruitful and multiply. And most of us think that means go make a lot of babies. Babies. Well, I think that is what they did, but I think more than making babies, it was the fruitfulness of their lives. God wanted something more than just offspring. He wanted a fruitfulness to their whole life. He, he reiterates that same command to Noah in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, right? Destroys the earth with a flood. He brings back human, human race through, through Noah, and he says to Noah, be fruitful and multiply. He tells Abram, he hasn't had his name changed to Abraham yet, in Genesis, 17, uh, Genesis chapter 17, verse 6, he tells him, Abra, Abram, I'm going to make you, make you, I'm going to do this exceedingly fruitful. That's part of what I want you to accomplish. He says to a husband in Proverbs 128 verse 3 that a wife in a husband's home should be a fruitful vine within your house and your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Okay, this idea of health and growth and fruitfulness is, is part of what God wants for us. See, here's the deal. God wants us to be fruitful for his glory right? That, that, that's part of what it means. And what is true for us individually as Christians needs to be true of us as husbands and wives. Friendship within marriage should be friendship that produces fruit. It's fruitful. So Michelle should make me more fruitful. I should make her more fruitful. Now what does this look like? Well, Charles Spurgeon is a great preacher from the 18th century. He's a pastor in London. Um, and, and, and he says this in a letter to his wife. Listen to these, such sweet words. And I know, ladies, you'd love if your husband would write you notes like this. Listen, listen to this. He, he, he writes to her and he says, None know how grateful I am to God for you. In all I have ever done for him, you have a large share. For in making me so happy, you have fitted me for service. Not an ounce of power has ever been lost to the good cause through you. I have served the Lord far more and never less for your sweet companionship. Isn't that good? That's, that's fruitfulness within marriage. That is, that is what God wants for us. And one of the ways that God helps us to be fruitful within a marriage is by giving us what should be the best friend you will ever have to help us, to counsel us, to rebuke us when necessary. We'll talk about that in a little bit. To advise us, to challenge us, to encourage us. He wants there to be a deep abiding friendship that happens. See, look, I think everybody, I don't care if you're married or not, but I think everybody needs healthy doses of two things. We need healthy doses of encouragement, and then we need healthy doses of the part we don't like, and that's rebuke, because we're not perfect, right? I don't do everything right. And I need, I, I, I need somebody in my life that has permission to grab me by the face mask, pull me to the sidelines and go, what are you doing? That's wrong. You can't do it. I need to be rebuked at times. But I also need somebody who's going to come along when I'm depressed or I'm down or I'm hurt, I'm discouraged and encourage. And this is what God gives us in friends and what should be the ultimate friend, our husband, our, our wives. See, the Bible says if you're going to be fruitful, if you're going to do great things for God, you don't do it alone. Hey, nobody does. 
We need to surround ourselves with wise people. So the Bible, over and over, in all kinds of ways, Proverbs 13, 20 says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Now, the person you walk closest to is your husband, is your wife. And so he wants us to have wisdom surrounding you. Listen, if you're not married, hear me. This is one of the reasons I'll tell you, you must not, if you're a believer in Jesus, you must not marry a non-believer. You're not surrounding her. You will become like your friends. You will become like who you hang around with. You will become more godly or less godly based on the friends that you allow deeply, intimately into your life. Proverbs 20 verse 18 says, plans are established by counsel, by wise guidance wage war. Proverbs 24 verses 5 and 6 says, a wise man, you could put in woman here, is full of strength. A man of knowledge enhances his might. For by wise guidance you can wage your war and in the abundance of counselors there is victory. Listen, the greatest counselor I have in my life is my wife Michelle right? So that, so that I can't tell you how many times I've been ready to wage war and she's come along with a word of wisdom and reined me in. Why? Because friends don't let friends rage war without good advice, right? So, so, so we listen. I, I would be a fool not to listen to this friend that God has put into my life. This best friend, this, this, this one that I get counsel from, we take their advice. A friend like that makes us more fruitful, so, 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 so what about you? Are, are you, I'm not, I'm not asking, is your spouse that way to you? Are you that way to your spouse? I mean, if you're an engaged couple, are you that way to your fiance? Are you, are you that way if you're dating? Are you helping that person become more fruitful or are you dragging them down? Are you the kind of husband or wife that invites your spouse to play that role of help me be more fruitful? If not, then you are missing one of the very reasons that God gave you this friend in your life right? You, you, and the chances, look, you, you don't listen to them, you don't seek their counsel, and you don't enjoy a more fruitful life because you've stopped being friends. This is what real friends do for each other. We help. We, you ought to be more fruitful in all of your friendships because of those friendships, but especially the one you have in your home with your spouse. It ought to make you more fruitful, are you? Okay, the, the, the R is, is the word reciprocal. Here's what I mean. Friendship is reciprocal, right? There's no one-sided friendship. There ought not to be. Otherwise, it's not really a friendship, right? And what I mean when I say reciprocal is not, well, she did that to me, so I get to do that to her. No, it is, it is two people acting in mutually beneficial, loving, can I say, ways toward each other, okay? So I find it interesting. If you, if you look at Ephesians chapter 4, this is Paul. He's writing to a church in Ephesus and bef right before in the, in the book, right before he gets to talking to husbands and wives in particular, he gives this general command uh, to the people in the church in Ephesus, which is a command for us. He says this, verse, chapter 4, verse 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And then he says, and it keeps going in chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us, gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So over and over in the New Testament, we are told that we are supposed to love, you know, whatever, care for one another. And often we think, oh, that one another is the body of Christ. Yes, it is. But that one another is first and foremost the one another that you sleep in the same bed with in your home. It's I had to love Michelle that. So, so it means that I'm supposed to be tenderhearted and forgiving and loving toward her. And why? Paul tells us why. Because that's exactly what Christ did for me. That's exactly Christ, Christ right now, God right now in Christ is being tenderhearted, forgiving, merciful, loving, kind toward me. And so because of that, I'm supposed to now act out of the love that I've been given and do the same thing, Rochelle, and, and, and her for me. In other words, look, God doesn't ask you or me to do anything that he's not already doing and has not already done in your life. So he says, man, be, be kind what if we just took that right there and said, what if our homes, what if as friends, me and Michelle together decide we're going to be tenderhearted and kind and forgiving and loving? How, what a difference. 
What a difference this would make in most of our homes. Now, the Bible says, look, that we love because Christ first loved us. We don't, so, so that's, that, 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 that comes through us. Love, love is not something that get, just comes out of us naturally. It, it is something that flows through us. It's Christ's love flowing through us to each other. But listen, let me clear up a massive misconception about love in marriage. Some of you have this idea that love is a feeling, right? It's this, it's this emotion that you're supposed to feel. But biblically, that isn't it at all. It is always, all, I'm not saying biblically love has nothing to do with feelings. I'm saying it's first an action and that action will most likely result in feeling. It's not feeling first, then action. It's action first, then feeling. So Tim Keller, pastor in New York, uh, says very wisely, he says, if you love someone long enough, Okay, now listen to this. If you, and he's talking biblically now. If you love someone long enough, you'll eventually like them. I love that. Right? You'll eventually like them. Because look at, look, I, we, we don't just love our friends. We like them. I don't know of a friend that I have that I'm just like, you know, love that guy. I just don't like him and I don't want to be around him. Right, that doesn't work that way. Like you, you genuinely like this person. I like being around my friends. I like being around Michelle. We like each other. And if you will get up and serve and be active and do the loving thing, then you will, you will become, there will be love. Listen, a, 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 look, the Bible never ever commands me to feel loving toward Michelle or her to me, ever. Just think of that. How many divorces happen because we fell out of love with one another? Right? Like, I'm going to be able to stand before God someday and go, you know, the reason my marriage fell onto the rocks, God, is because I just stopped feeling love for Michelle. And he's going to look at me and he would be like, What's, what does feeling have to do with anything? Chris, I, I commanded you to love your wife. Isn't it interesting, by the way, that God commands us? If you really want proof of this, he commands us to love our enemies. The very people I can't feel loving towards, God says, love them. You got no choice in this. Love them. So he must not mean feeling. He must mean that I'm supposed to act it out. So I do that. We're supposed to be figuring out ways to show and be mutually beneficial toward each other in love. So now look, what that means, this reciprocation, it's not just the big ticket items. It's the, it's the little things. I mean, listen, guys, we'd say, oh, I'd take a bullet from my spouse. Of course you would, and you should, and that's good, and that's right. And that's what a man would do. But but will you, will you do the little day-by-day -day things of getting up off the couch and serving her and helping her, putting her needs above your own? I mean, think about this. How different would it look if you would just look in the small little events of the day to be saying, how, how can I bless this other person? Because they're my friend. They're my, they're my best friend. Right? I mean, I mean so, so, so think about that. Maybe, maybe that's part of what you want to think and maybe talk about and, and, and go home and, 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 you know, process this with each other. I, I was thinking about it this morning. I've told Michelle before, I said, you, you bless me. When I, when I get up out of bed and you've already, you know, from the night before whenever, you've, you've got the coffee ready to go and I just press the button. You know, it's not a big deal for me to scoop, scoop, scoop and pour water. There's something about them like, oh, just, you know. she does it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, just, uh, thank you. Woo, I only had to press the button. <laughs> right? I mean, just, just little things where you realize that blesses me. That blesses me that you, you do these little things for me. I mean, it, this is where life is lived. This is the mundaneness. This is, this is where real friendship, ch ch I mean, if we would just stop, stop for a minute and think, this is my best friend. How would I treat my best friend? How, how would this change things? Michelle says it all the time. You're my best friend. I can guarantee if you asked her. Do you always feel like that? I mean, is it BFF forever with you and Chris? <laughs> and she'd be like, well, no. I don't feel it but I say it all the time. I say it all the time because I want that to be true. We tell our kids, hey, who's your best friend? And if they point to anybody outside the family, like, no, 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 you're each other's best friend. They're like, oh, no, we're not. <laughs> we're gonna remind them that until they grow up and guess what? I guarantee there's coming a day where they'll go, my best friend is my sister. My best friend is my brother. 
We remind ourselves of that all the time. We want to be friends. So that's the reciprocation of friendship. The I is, is intimate, okay? And, and here's what I mean by intimacy, okay? Song of Solomon is, is an entire book in your Bible. I preached on it a few years ago. I'll probably do it here in the next couple of years. But anyways, it's an entire Bible in your book that is dedicated to romantic sexual love within marriage, okay? And within that book... The woman says of the man in chapter 5, verse 16, she says, this is my beloved and this is my friend. I love that. Right there in the middle of your, your Bible is a scripture where we're called to be friends with one another. Now, in the book, and you can pick up a copy of the book, by the way, that, that, that this series is based on, but Mark and Grace Driscoll do, I think, a very helpful thing. They, they, they talk about there's three kinds of marriages. There's back-to-back marriages, there's shoulder-to-shoulder marriages, and there's face-to-face marriages. Now, back-to-back marriage is where, the, where the, the couple has, you know, they got married and then they ended up turning their backs on one another. Like some of you, you maybe share a bed and you share a pot of coffee and all that, but you might get into that bed and you literally turn over. Right? You, are, you are not only literally back-to-back, you are spiritually and, 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 and figuratively living back-to-back lives. You're now enemies. You're strangers in the same house. Why? You stop being friends. Then there's shoulder-to-shoulder marriages. Shoulder-to-shoulder marriages are ones where the couple works together on tasks and efforts and different activities. Like maybe it's raising the kids. Maybe it's running errands. Maybe it's, you know, uh, coaching a, a team. Maybe it's cleaning the house. Maybe it's planting a garden. Maybe it's building a business. You work together on that task to be successful at that. There's nothing wrong with that. So there's face-to-face which ought to be part of every healthy marriage. And that is, it's one in which the couple gets lots of face-to-face time for conversations, for friendships, for, for unpacking things in their lives, for intimacy. So now, guys, let me ask you something. Where is it, is it uh, when you look at us, what are we, what are we most of? And I'm going to be very general here, but I think you'll get the point. We're, we're, when it comes to friendship, which one of those three categories are we most comfortable with? Back-to-back, shoulder-to-shoulder, face-to-face. I think the answer is shoulder to shoulder, right? Because if you ask most guys about their close guy friends, it centers around an activity. Oh, we played high school baseball together, right? We, we did this. We, we, we conquered this task together. And, and through that, we became very good friends, right? That, that's that's the, the basis. And you know what? A lot of guys are like, uh, our whole relationship is based around this task and boy, you take away us talking about baseball, we got nothing to talk about, right? It's kind of, uh, I've, I'm, I'm done asking questions. I don't know what else to t- say to you, okay? So, 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 so ours tend to center around activity. Then you got ladies. What are you obviously better at than guys? Face to face, right? I mean, you guys like to, like to sit down. You talk about things guys would never talk about. You have these intimate conversations. You go and you take long lunch hours and, and you look each other in the eye and you sip coffee together. Listen, just so you know, I, I, I've never sat across a table and looked into another man's eyes <laughs> with my coffee, okay? I, I, I just, I, you know, I'm not saying I've never had coffee with guys, but you're kind of like, yeah, hey, buddy, well, you know, what, and, and you, you don't, you don't, it's not an intimate moment, right? It's usually like, hey, we're going to talk about this and we're done, right? <laughs> so now listen, shoulder to shoulder, face to face, have a place in a marriage, right? So, so, so look, ladies, you say to me, I want to connect with my husband, right? And so you automatically default with and you say in order to connect with him he needs to talk to me in certain ways and we need to stare in each other's eyes and I'll get to the guys in a minute but ladies what can you do to take your part and enter his world right is he a sports guy he just loves basketball or baseball or football or whatever okay then then could you sit down and endure the 18 hour baseball game I don't know how people get into this but anyways uh Sit down and, and, and watch that. And, and, and guys, let me give you a hint, by the way. If you'll just tell her, like if you know a backstory of the pitcher on the mound, tell her about his life. And she'll be like, oh, I love this guy. Watch him all day, right? 
right? I mean, listen, isn't this how the Olympics hooks us? It hooks the whole family because guys were like, yeah, they're, you know, they, and then, and then they kind of go, oh, and let's tell you this really sweet story about this Cuban girl and what she's, you know, and you're like, oh, and all the ladies are like, oh, that's wonderful. I'm, I don't care about America. Go Cuba, right? <laughs> right? See, see, so you, you, you go, okay, what does he enjoy? Does, is he a gardener? You know, is he a, is he a football guy? Is he a, is he a guy that loves to go fishing or hunting or whatever? Can I enter his world somewhere? Even though at first, I mean, look, Michelle watches UFC with me, right? Like, I guarantee the first time she starts, like, oh, God, oh, yeah, ugh, you know, like, making her throw up. And then she starts watching over time. She, like, starts to get to know, oh, you know, he, he's, and she starts, if she's named, she knows, like, what they're good at. And, and it, she's entered my world. Listen, one of the greatest things that's happened to me I used to be, so some of you don't know, I used to be a lawyer in my former life, and, and uh, look, I, I would come home, and I, I was a lawyer, and I'd come home to my family, and there was, there was really no intersection between the two, and, and I know this is true of a lot of you, but I'm just telling you, for me personally, one of the greatest blessings is in becoming a pastor, Michelle's been, to, been able to enter the world of this, if you will, task with me. So we can be shoulder to shoulder and going, you know, and, and she can be a, an advisor and a counselor and a helper to me as, as I try to lead Foothill Church. It's been one of the most satisfying things and building of, uh, of our relationship. I love having her at my side. But guys, so what does it take for us? What should we do? Well, we got to learn to connect with our wives at a deeper level, right? I mean, listen, you come home, you got to learn to speak from your heart. I know this is weird for us, but we need to learn to do that. So when she asks you how your day was, she's honestly not asking you for that one word answer that you usually give her. Like, fine, good. She wants, she's not, she's, she's probably not even asking you for facts. She's trying to get behind and go, I'm trying to get into your world. I want in. Will you tell me something and we can engage over this? And so, guys, look, we, we got to learn. She, she wants to know how you feel, and we got to learn to, to look our wives in the eyes and engage with them without distractions, right? You know, what, were you talking to me? You know, because I was just looking at the SPN, you know, right, right, put it away. I, I've been at my table, and my girls will be like, Dad, why do you have the phone at the table? I have no excuse. I was guilty. Done. Okay, I'll get rid of it. Sorry. Because we do this, right? You're reading the newspaper. You're letting yourself get distracted. You're not taking time to go, let's just talk. Um, and, and listen, you got to learn to listen to her heart. And, and this was a great epiphany for me, okay? Maybe some of you learned this. You're masters at this. I didn't know this, okay? When I first got married, I literally did not understand this. I thought when Michelle came to me to tell me a problem, okay, I'm like, horse stance, let's do this thing, right? <laughs> give it to me, baby, let's, let's talk, and I'm going to give you the answer. I'm going to solve your problem. And one day she's like, Chris, I don't, I don't want you to solve my problem. I just want you to hear me. And I'm like, what is that for? Like, why would I even do that, right? <laughs> and you realize, no, no, that's exactly what she, she's not, she doesn't want me to fix her. She wants me to listen to her. Just stop and listen to her and just go, and you know, I've had to learn to do the, you know, okay, I, I get there, there, sorry. <laughs> Come here, I guess you need a hug right now. Is that what I'm supposed to do, right? Right? I'll do that stuff for you. I want to help you. She needs me to hear, she needs to hear me say. I've been amazed by this, guys. I've been amazed how often just saying to her, sweetie, it's going to be okay. She's heard. And then she's like, oh, I, as a guy, right, we don't get that, right? But they do. And she knows you're with her and she knows you. Listen, C.J. Mahaney has said something I think is so wise. He was speaking to husbands and he said, he's a pastor, and he said this, husbands, don't touch her body until you first touched her mind and her heart. That is such wise. Because guys, you know, let's be honest. You, you go straight for the body. And you don't stop to go, she wants to engage you emotionally first. She wants to engage you intellectually first. So, so, so see, many of you want a great marriage. I know I do. 
And we complicate it with all kinds of things, right? We, 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 you know, it's got to be this. And there's all these things we're supposed to do. When in fact, if you just sort of boil it down to its essence and say, if you just work on being a good friend like you are to other people, how, how different your relationship would be. Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the I. The E stands for enjoyable. Now, I love this. Because listen, do you understand that God wants you to enjoy each other? He wants you to enjoy your marriage. Listen, I, I can guarantee that you got married because you enjoyed one another. Unless your parents like arranged a birth, you know, a marriage at birth and you were forced to get married, you're somebody that goes, no, you looked at this person that you held hands with at the altar and you said, I'm doing this because I really enjoy this person. I don't know anybody. It's like, you know what? My life sucks. This is terrible. Uh, you know, may as well just get married to this loser. <laughs> I hate her. I don't like her, but I'm going to marry her. No, you, you do it because you go, I enjoy, look at, listen to Ecclesiastes 9, verse 9. It says, en I love this, enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Now you could read that as a real downer verse. Like, ah, just enjoy life, whatever. It doesn't all matter. I don't think that's what Solomon's saying. I think this word vanity, vain in scripture is a word that means it's vaporous. It, 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 it goes by like that. And he's saying, look, God's given you a wife. Take this short life that's going to pass very quickly and enjoy what God has given you, including your spouse. Enjoy one another, right? I said last week, I mean, I asked you the question, do you enjoy your spouse? Because you ought to, because life really, really sucks sometimes. And it doubly sucks if you don't enjoy your spouse. But if you do, what a difference. What a difference. See, I, I don't know about you, but I I can tell you, I got married to Michelle because I said, I want to enjoy life more. I do. I, I want, there, I have a passion for my own enjoyment, and so do you, and so does every other person on planet Earth, and I want, and I think she is one of the keys to that. And you know what I think? I think God is pleased when a husband, in fact, I would say it this way, God is worshipped most fully when we enjoy each other in marriage. See, because I think God likes it. I'm kind of a cheapskate. I don't like to spend money a whole lot. But, but I think God loves it when I blow cash on Michelle. We blow cash on going out to dinner and enjoying a, a nice time together, whatever. I think he likes it when we get dressed up and we laugh with each other and, and we just enjoy our time together. I think that pleases. I think that's how we worship God with our marriage. In fact, I, I would say to you, look, if God wants my marriage to glorify him, then, then I believe he wants Michelle and I to enjoy because we cannot, you, you don't, we don't, nobody glorifies anything they don't enjoy. If you hate your job, you will not glorify it. You'll come home and you'll tell everybody how terrible it is. If you hate a movie, as silly as it sounds, right? You don't come home and go, I hated it. You got to go see it. <laughs> we don't do that. What do we do? We go see a movie. We love a job, whatever. What we enjoy, we glorify. Oh my gosh, I want you to come out on my boat. Oh my gosh, you've got to go see this movie. And when it comes to your marriage, you're going to start talking about it being like, this is one of the greatest things that ever happened to me you got to get one of these marriages. It's awesome. That's glory to God. That, that, that glo so, so look, so what do you do? What's practically? I think for Michelle and I, it, you know, honestly, it doesn't look the same all the time. It means I take Fridays off. Uh, we, we just spend time together. We'll go out, you know, work out together in the morning. We might go out to breakfast or lunch, go eat something nice. We, we love food, right? We just love like eating. And, and so we, we, we do that. We, we just, we just, and so we can sit there and talk and unpack things. And, you know, and then she enters my world because we start talking about tasks or I enter her world. Where we start talking about how she's feeling or things that are bugging her or things that she's excited about, whatever. So, 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 so it doesn't always look the same and it doesn't have to be some wildly expensive thing. I mean, some of you could just go to a coffee shop and just spend time together and, 
and, and, and, and, and conversing, getting, getting into each other's world. That's intimacy, okay? It's not just the sexual part. It's the intimacy of a relationship there, okay? The N stands for needed, needed. I, I think this is, if you read your Bible and, and what we looked at last week, we said that God, what does he do in Genesis chapter 1? He makes Adam. He forms him out of the dust of the ground. He brings all the animals. The animals start, you know, he starts naming him. He's like, hey, what gives? Everybody's got a companion but me, right? There's a female and a male elephant. And they all go together. And I think God does that to make something go off in Adam's heart. Like, I, I don't like this. And so God looks down and says, it's not good for Adam, the man, to be alone. So what does he do? He brings her. He brings Eve to him and he calls her a helper. I'm going to make him a helper. It's a, literally the word is a correspondent. In other words, where he zigs, she's going to zag and they're going to go together. And, and, and she's going to be a companion and a friend. See, see, he needed that kind of wife. She needed that kind of, uh, of husband. So look at our first and greatest need in life is a friendship with God. And this is exactly what God says, that through Jesus Christ, we can have a friendship. Not a religion, not something I just sort of dabble in, something that is, something that is a vital relationship. You can have a personal relationship to, with God through Jesus Christ. He'll forgive you of your sins. He'll cleanse you of your unrighteousness. And he will then say, like he says to the disciples, I know they'll call, no longer call you my disciples. I call you my friends. No greater love has anyone than this than a man lays down his life for a friend. And Jesus lays down his life. So that's your, that's your greatest need. But then following up on that is that we need friendship with other people. And the way God remedies that for Adam is to bring him Eve. And for Eve, she brings him Adam. Friends are not optional. You die without friends. Hopeless people are lonely people. It's true. No man is an island. We really need someone in our lives. We, we need to belong. We, we need someone to belong to us. We have this, this innate desire to know and to be known at an intimate level, which, which is why, by the way... <laughs> You know, despite what Facebook has done to us, we don't have that many friends. Y you probably have in your life, maybe, of these kinds of friends, maybe less than a handful that really know you, that really are inside your life, that you know, that they know, you know each other's flaws, you know each other's highs and lows, all that. See, friends are necessary and one of the greatest gifts that God gives us is a friend who knows us better than anyone. That's your spouse. Should, should be. Should be your spouse. This is why we don't, you know, you, you should not have the kind of friendship I'm talking he with here with someone from the opposite sex. That should not happen because you could very easily, you may already be there, having an emotional affair with somebody, emotional adultery, that could very easily lead into physical adultery. So, so we, we reserve that for, if it's of the opposite sex, it's our spouse. And God says the person that you can be closest to in the world is her, is him. See, see there was a day, if you're married... There was a day, and hopefully it's still there, but for some of you, it's a thing of the past when you couldn't imagine life without the person you're going to marry, right? You couldn't imagine, I'm married to this person, and there was a day when I look back, and I, I wanted to spend every waking moment with her, with him. I wanted that, and then the busyness of life sets in, right? You start becoming a, a chauffeur and a cook, and you're doing all these things in the home, and, and you're so busy that you stop being friends, you start being roommates, and now you think, you know, I don't think... I want to spend every waking moment with him or her. I'd actually like it if I didn't see him or her today. How sad. And I don't say that to discourage you. I said that that's not what God wants and God can restore that and God can give you a friendship where you get back to that place where you say, I really love this person. I really like this person. See, what happened? You stopped being friends. You thought, and this happens to a lot of married couples, they think that marriage takes the place of friendship because what we're, we're living on the same roof now right we sleep in the same bed now we share the vanity counter together we you know squeeze out of the same toothpaste 
and you stopped working on your friendship. And no, no, don't ever, don't ever stop working and affirming the need for a friendship. See, look at real marriage doesn't exist without friendship. It just doesn't. So you can't go it alone. God doesn't want you to go alone. He wants you to enjoy this necessary friend that he's put in your life called your husband, called your wife. Okay? D stands for devoted. Devoted. And this might be one of the greatest things about friendship is there's somebody who's devoted to you, right? Faithful to the end, right? They stick with you. They're, they're not there when things are just happy and good and the money's all good. They're there when the bottom drops out of your life. They are what Paul says to the Romans in Romans 12, 15. He says that we as believers should rejoice with those who rejoice. We're laughing, we're excited, you know, whatever. And we should weep with those who weep. I tell you, honestly, one of the greatest things in my, I, I love it when something humorous happens and it makes Michelle laugh. I don't know why it is. I just, it, it warms my heart. I like, I love, I love that she's laughing at something or, you know, and, and, and it's amazed, amazes me that if I'm sad, she's weeping for me. So it shouldn't just be, I rejoice with you as believers and I, I weep with you as believers. That ought to be happening in my home. Uh, my mom and dad, uh, some of you know that my dad, on May 1st, my dad died. He was 74 years old, and to be honest with you, it was a surprise. Um, I thought I was going to have my dad for 10, 15 more years. But as God would have it, my parents actually were on an extended trip out here in California. I grew up in Sacramento. Um, they grew up in Sacramento. And so in the course of their life, the closest friends they ever had were, were up north. Uh, there, there, were, there were couples up there that my mom and dad went to high school with, were in the same church youth group, got married about the same time, started having kids about the same time. I and mean, these were families that were so close. I used to call their children my, my cousins, their, their moms and dads. I call them my aunt and uncle. That's the kind of, of, of closeness that we had. And here, now, decades later, my parents come through town and, and my dad gets sick and he goes in the hospital and those friends just rallied around my mom and dad. And I remember just thinking, God, give me friends like that. Because the Bible says, Proverbs 18 says, that there's a, there's a, if a man's gonna be a friend, he's gonna have friends, he needs to be friendly, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. There are friends like that. That was what my mom and dad experienced. That's what my dad experienced right before he died. That's what my mom did for my dad. She was faithful to him. She was devoted to him. She sat at his side. And one of the greatest comforts in the world. Isn't this true? I know that if something happened to me, that if, you know, I was incapacitated or whatever, my mo if, if I was down, when I have been down, when, when I feel like the bottom has come out of my life, I've got this devoted friend, Michelle, who's always going to be there. This is what friends do. We're devoted to one another. And that leaves us with the S. And what do you think the S stands for? Nope, sanctifying. <laughs> sanctifying. If devoted is the greatest part, then sanctifying is maybe the hardest part. Now here's what I mean. Marriage has a way of making you grow up. It just does. Right? You get married, so you got responsibilities, you got to deal with things, you got to go, I got to pay bills, I got to do all this stuff. And look, this is, that, that, that's why I'm not a big fan, just so you hear me, uh, young people, I'm not a big fan of this modern trend of waiting until you're like 30 to get married. If you're an able-bodied man who can go out and find a job and you're in your early 20s, you ought to be looking for a bride. I'm just telling you. There is, I, I see no advantage and don't tell me, oh, I'm just trying to wait till I can afford it. You'll never afford it, <laughs> ever. You go get a job, you'll get a wife, you love her, you provide for her, and you let what marriage will do to you do that to you. And you know what it'll do? It's like a rock tumbler. <laughs> you come with all these sharp edges and stuff, and you guys get in the tumbler together, and you roll around for long enough, and a good marriage will be one when you pull the rocks out of the tumbler, they're smooth and beautiful. And you've shaved off each other's edges. And if you don't, guess what? Guys especially. We end up just extending our adolescence until we're 30. Right? Keep playing video games, sit in our pajamas, blogging, whatever. 
doing nothing with our lives and being real squirrely and immature. When God says, no, I want, I want there to be a weight on your shoulders, that's a good thing. So, so that's my two cents about waiting. But listen, I think what marriage does is it, is it does that. It sanctifies us. God wants it. That's one of the primary ways of sanctifying me is in this marriage because it reveals things about me that I would never have seen. I didn't know I was that selfish. I didn't know I was that angry. I didn't know whatever. I didn't know I was that impatient until I got married and now there's this other person rubbing against me and I'm like, wait, whoa, oh really? That's, I'm not supposed to be that way? Right? Like, like marriage lets someone else see the real you and, and then they come alongside you. Listen to Ecclesiastes 4. I love this. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. But then listen to verse 10. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. In other words, what a, what a sorry state of affairs if I sin and there is, there is not the, 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 the other one beside me to help lift me up. And that is no more true, should be no more true than in a marriage. That ought to be the place where, where God has somebody in my life and me in somebody's life where when we fall and we will fall, we will fail, I will sin, she will sin, we're there to lift each other up. Because we didn't jump to the S in sanctifying. We're F-R-I-E-N-D first. And so now she can accept when I need to come along and lift her up. And I can accept when she needs to come along and lift me up. See, I need Michelle for all the reasons that I've talked about so far. But one of the greatest gifts God gave me in Michelle was her sanctifying influence. I, I, I kid you not. There, uh, there, there are sins that have dropped out of my life because I married Michelle. There are things that I don't struggle with anymore because I married Michelle. Some of those, they dropped off, if you will, passively. She never had to confront me over them. Others, there's things where she's had to say, I gotta tell you. But you know what the Bible says? Proverbs 27 says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Real friends wound each other when necessary. Like, there's no joy in that, right? I love sticking the knife in you. Some of you do. That's evil. That's wrong. Okay, no. She's never enjoyed confronting sin in me. I've never enjoyed confronting sin in her. But you do it because you love. And a godly friend loves you enough to speak the truth. A godly friend hates your sin enough to, to, to not say, you know, to go, I'm not just going to keep the peace. I'm going to point it out and I want to do it humbly. Now listen, don't you dare go home from this and say, you know, I just got carte blanche from Pastor Chris and the Word of God to start telling you, you're rotten, our marriage stinks because of you, and you got to repent. And here's all the things that bug me about you. That's not it at all. If you haven't gone through F-R-A-N-D, don't get to, don't get to S. Right? Because what will happen is that Proverbs 9 says... That if Michelle does to me, th does that to me, and she, she rebukes me, she points out something in me, it says, rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. There's two things I want you to see about that. That, that, that begs the question, am I a wise man? If I'm not wise, I won't love her. If I am wise, the response will be love. It'll be thank you. I'm a better person because of what you just pointed out. I'm a more godly man. I'm a better Christ follower. Listen, Michelle and I don't go around pointing out each other's faults. No, because there's this other principle called forbearance where, look, I know she has faults. She knows I have faults. And you know what we do? You know, you know, you know what we should do? I'm not saying we do this perfectly every time. You know what we should do and what you should do? There ought to be this, this mindset that you have that says, I know she's going to sin against me. I know he's going to sin against me. And I decide right now before it happens, I will forgive. This is what Jesus does for you. And that's why we do it for each other. See, now, now look. 
So I don't go around just pointing out her sin because that's not what confronting sin looks like and she doesn't do that to me. It's not saying, you know, things are terrible because of you. That, that's not healthy, that's not good. But it does mean that when Michelle sees sin in my life, she has permission to confront it. She's the one. She's my most trusted advisor. She's this friend who sticks closer to her brother. She's devoted to me. She makes me more fruitful. And now when she points it out, I say, I don't like hearing that. That wasn't fun. I don't like surgery and being cut open, but I see it and it's necessary. And you know what? You know what, you know what she does? She's, she's very wise. Okay? Like, like she sees something in me. She doesn't just go, hey, you know, boom. I mean, she, she does things as simple as like, feed me first, right? Then I'm fat and stuff. She's like, you're a jerk. But no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> she, she feed, but she prays about it. God, I pray that as I talk to Chris and I confront him about this thing, God, soften his heart and help me to go into it with the motive not to pin him against the wall, but to glorify you and for his good. I want to minister to him. And if he gets angry and flies off the handle, it's not going to do anything. And I don't want to do that. That's godly. That's, that's, that's how sanctification works in a marriage. So look at, does God want you to enjoy your marriage? Yes. Does God want your marriage to change you? I didn't say to change Michelle, to, to change me. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's what a great friendship does. There's not a great friendship that you have that doesn't mold you, shape you, change you. Which is why we start with, how's your friendship with Jesus? The ultimate friendship that will change you, that will sanctify you, that'll make you more fruitful. Do you realize you can have a friendship with Jesus? How's your friendship with your spouse? I don't want you to go home and be like, I got 15 things to work on to have a better marriage. No, I don't want to complicate it for you. I want to boil it down to its essence and say, you know what? If all you do is go home with this big idea, be a friend. Be a friend. Love her enough to be a loving, godly, loyal, good friend. How different the marriages in this room would be. How abundant and fruitful they could be. Take the best friend you've ever had and say, you know what? I'm going to start making that person my spouse, my wife, my husband. I'm going to invest in them and just be a friend. And I think it'll change everything. Bow your heads and let's pray. Father, I'm so grateful. You've said that Greater man has no love than this, and he lays down his life for his friend. That you said through Jesus and our relationship, Jesus now calls us friends. And I pray, Lord, if there's anybody in this room today who does not know Jesus Christ in that personal relationship, they may know religion. They may, they may think that what's going to make God love me more is me doing more for him and instead realizing all that God is doing is wanting to bring you from being his enemy to being his friend through the cross of Jesus Christ. So God, convict of sin and unrighteousness, cause people to turn and run to you and God, in that, they would see that you, you accept them not only as friend but as family. We're now brothers and sisters. We're now children of God. Do that, I pray. And Lord, I pray for marriages in this room. God, where, where they are, that they're, they're hurting and, and, and they're trying to figure out the way through. Lord, may the simplicity of this just, just cut through a lot of the, the fog. And may they, even today, decide what they're going to invest in is a friendship. And that over time, as they actively love one another in friendship, they would learn again to like being with each other. And there would be a day in the not too distant future where they could say, this is my beloved and this is my friend. Do what we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.